would you start telling us more on how should startups approach risk assessment from a legal standpoint when adopting AI technologies? I'm happy to, Luis. Thank you so much for uh, the introduction here. Thanks for all for coming today. Uh, it's kind of odd that we should begin the conversation with law, right? Because law is usually the tail on the dog, and that's the appropriate place for law here. Uh, <laughs> nevertheless, it's it's interesting that as AI hit the scene worldwide, that the first conversations really concerned the dangers of AI. And now we're into a stage when uh, there have already been a number of class action lawsuits uh, uh, filed against the large AI players, Google, OpenAI, um, and uh, 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 others. So it's probably worthwhile um, at least disposing of kind of these legal risk issues right up front, especially for startups, because startups are in a fragile, it's a fragile time of life for a company. Mm -hmm. If you're in a startup company, and you really want to make sure that you have the foundation right, and that you're not early on when you're, you can least afford it, exposing yourself to the kinds of risks that would be endangering your business. So in thinking about risk assessment, legal risk assessment for startups, it really comes in two dimensions primarily. One is the use of AI as a tool in the conduct of your business. And the other is the use of AI as a product or as part of a product that you yourself are offering. So let me talk first about your use of AI as a tool. Uh, here, it's the, the legal issues are really uh, not different in kind from any other tool you might be using in your business, right? Um, any other kind of information that you're relying on, any other kind of software that you're relying on, um, <clears throat> uh, it's it's very very similar. And so, the the kinds of concerns you really ought to have in using AI to say respond to customer requests or to provide feedback to customers or to uh, manage customers or to uh, help to build your product, the concerns really go to your need to provide due diligence, your need to inspect what the AI is coming up with um, as part of your response to your customer or to your partners. Um, so uh, if, if you're in a position of trust in particular, uh, whether you're maybe in healthcare, uh, in law certainly, but even in education, in finance, uh, if you're using AI as part of the process for responding to customer requests, you really need to get in and use due diligence. And as a matter of fact, there's a, a kind of um, case in point here that occurred a couple of months ago where a lawyer um, was providing a brief to um, uh, a court and used open AI, used, used ChatGPT to construct his response, ChatGPT came back with uh, a, what seemed to be a very certain of answer, answer to the question, uh, and it even supplied uh, citations to that lawyer's uh, uh, memorandum in support of his brief, and <clears throat> the citations didn't exist. The law wasn't real, and the, the lawyer was subsequently sanctioned by the court. Um, for using that without exercising any kind of human judgment, human intelligence for the oversight of the, his answer, right? Um, the other thing, another thing that you need to be care of, careful about when you're using AI as a tool is keep in mind that all of the tools that exist so far are not local. They're, they're not running at your machine. They're running in the cloud. So any information that you provide as part of uh, uh, the formulation of an answer or response to your client, that's that's being uploaded to OpenAI's cloud. And that's being uploaded to Google, to Bing, um, and others. Uh, so you really want to keep company information, proprietary information, personal information outside, out of the of any interaction with these AIs to the degree possible here. Um, because you've lost control of it the moment it goes up there. As a matter of fact, if you look carefully enough at what OpenAI uh, calls out in its own legal terms and conditions, uh, they have a right to the use of that information. So you may potentially have forfeited any proprietary rights uh, or any private privacy that you have 
uh, by providing that information as part of your inquiry using that AI. Um, the third piece here is what I call provenance, um, what I call introspection. So in other words, if an AI comes up with a conclusion to an answer that you raise of it, um, your ability to, to ask it, how do you know that? Or ask it, how did you arrive at that conclusion? Is really pretty limited because its own ability for to introspect on its own um, call it chain of logic uh, is pretty limited, and so you 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 really want to carefully consider uh, whether what it's providing you is a conclusion, and if so, what that conclusion might be predicated on, because you're not going to have the ability in most cases to say how did you get there, how did you arrive at that conclusion. You have you may need to, in many cases iteratively ask it um, further and further uh, questions based on the answer that it supplies. So that kind of covers the set of considerations for startup having to do with its use as a tool. The second piece here, and I want to get through this quickly, forgive me for going on at length, really re concerns if you are a startup using AI as part of your product, or in, indeed if, if an AI is part of your product, if you have uh, a, a, a large language model or even a limited language model that you're using uh, as your product for the market, you want to consider fundamentally three things. One is the contractual relationship and the business relationship that you have on the supplier of the AI. Second is, uh, again, third party information. Um, um, there, the use of, of that AI uh, where there are where you're relying on <clears throat> the information that it's built upon, the information that it was trained upon. And the third has to do with product liability. Let me race through these real quickly and then I'll then I'll be quiet because we need to move on. One is the reliance on your on consider the reliance on the supplier. If you're building a, a, a product, you're you're in a contract with OpenAI, you're in a contract with Google and their LLM, and you're building using their APIs. Um, consider the fact that um, that introduces a lot of contractual and business risk. If something goes wrong, take a look. See whether you can look to them to backstop you or, so to speak, indemnify you for what it is you're relying on them for. In most cases, the answer is you're not going to be able to rely on them. And mo in most cases, the answer is they can change or withdraw that product at will. So, And they can do that. Uh, based on the contract they have with you, which more often than not is a, a click wrap, right? More often than not says that by by supplying my username and ID and clicking on the button, okay, I assent to these terms and conditions. We never read the terms and conditions, but be careful what you're signing up for. Um, <clears throat> the other has, uh, the, another issue here uh, concerning that <clears throat> same issue is consider the intellectual property risk, because those same providers may have may have rights to inspect what it is you're doing here. And if you're developing something that you think is a is a proprietary product, consider that by using their product, you may have volunteered um, trade secrets to them. You may have volunteered methodologies that you you had hoped to keep secret, uh, and thereby you know gain proprietary rights but you may give those up as part of the contract with them. Another piece here concerns your use of third-party info. Let's suppose that, um, <clears throat> that you're offering a medical AI, or in, in, in my case, <laughs> uh, a legal AI. Well, again, uh, as, as in using it as a tool, there, if you're using third-party info and volunteering third-party info, consider the privacy and confidentiality concerns here. Uh, and to the degree that you're using proper names, to the degree that you're using personally identifiable information, to the degree that you're using intellectual property belonging to third parties, uh, that exposes you to a good deal of risk. And indeed, if you look at all of the court cases filed, and there have been many over the past six months, beginning in January, beginning shortly after OpenAI made its announcement, um, artists galore have, have come forth with primarily copyright lawsuits against these people, um, saying that you've copied my 
my script, you've copied my book, you've copied my images, you've copied my movies, and and um, therefore you've infringed my copyright. Now I have personally some qualms with that legally. I don't think that that many of these seats are terribly well founded. And I won't go into that right now, but nevertheless, that's an exposure. And your customers may come at you for exactly the same thing, even if you're using open AI as a, as a uh, and their APIs as the mechanism for supplying whatever service you're supplying. Finally, there's this issue of product liability. And product liability goes to, in part, to your negligence. But in law, especially in the United States, it's pretty well settled that in many cases, there's something called strict liability, where if something goes wrong, it doesn't matter whether a court finds you negligent um, uh, in, in providing this service. You can sometimes be held strictly liable for any bad consequences here. And as, as AI matures and as it begins to offer what are called function calling, for example, where it's not merely the exchange of a, of a conversation, but if your product is, is using function calling to, let's say, control an automobile, let's say, control other programs that um, may have to do with social media or may have to do with background inquiries on people, um, the AI is going to become increasingly powerful, not only in providing conversation to you, but in making things happen in the real world. And that can introduce strict product liability in some cases for what you're, what you're offering. Uh, if something goes wrong or something goes out of control and your ability to control things may be uh, severely limited. So I hope that provides a, a good over, overview and I hope I haven't gone on too long. Louise, back to you. Thanks. Yeah, uh, it does. It really helped us. And, you know, I have this 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 thing, this thing since my journalism years, which is I'm always taking notes. And uh, so I learned a lot. And I feel like, you know, when you're talking about startups and there are several entrepreneurs or, you know, people who are creating uh, a company who are there since the beginning, and they have these great ideas and they really want to, to change things. But they, you know, uh, they really don't know, you know, everything, and and that's normal, right? Right? We will never be able to know everything, so there might be, you know, some some troubles there when get, getting the law part right, you know, with this this legal this legal um, agreements uh, correctly. So I feel like you know talking about what we should be aware of. It's also telling entrepreneurs and and startup investors and councils, you know, that's what you should look for when you're creating your technology. You know, that's something that really impact people's lives. And uh, so uh, thank you very, very much. Um, uh, your insights will sure make us all reflect about how important, um, you know, these risks, you know, the, they come with innovation. You know, we're changing the world and and that's all that that always involves, you know, risks. So now let's uh, delve deeper into how startups can prepare for constantly changing challenges, which is, you know, uh, working at startups, having a startup is always about changing challenges. Um, and we have the privilege of welcoming Don, a visionary in the field of business strategy. Don will share his vision of the new due that diligence and how startups can stay one step ahead. And that's really important, right? So Don, how are these savvy investors approaching investments when they are based on AI? Oh, thanks, Luis, and, and, and thank you, Rob. Um, that was fantastic. And um, I, I, I'm used to paying, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of dollars uh, per hour for that kind of wisdom <laughs> from a lawyer. So uh, thanks to everybody for, for organizing this. I mean, that was I'm glad we're recording this because those pearls of wisdom are, are definitely something that I, I would love every startup to to listen to uh, about the the risks you need to do your due diligence about the risks that you're taking uh, when when you're introducing again all this amazing new stuff new products new services uh, you know there can be unintended consequences and you you just you, you need to be aware um, you know I'll, I'll you know be talking mostly about specifically in terms of due diligence uh, because it's such a hot topic right now for for startups that are raising um, and how investors uh, that you know have 
uh, you know, been dealing with a, a really dynamically changing landscape in the last you know year or two, uh, and, and how they're looking at due diligence. So, you know, many of us know the the quote, you know, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it, um, and. and it is a unique time, right? We we obviously that you know in human history there wasn't AI before. The technology is new, but a lot of the underlying issues are are you know very very old. Um, and, and if if you're not familiar with the Holland tulip bubble of the 1600s, um, it's a great story. Uh, you know, Google it, uh, check it out. It's fascinating the way people uh, were spending uh, as much money as they would on a gorgeous mansion uh, in Amsterdam uh, as they would for one tulip bulb. And and obviously that bubble burst and we've seen it, um, you know, those of us that live through the dot coms and of course the, the mortgages and, and crypto NFTs, um, you know, we, we don't seem to learn from history. We seem to repeat it thinking that, uh, you know, because we're dealing with a new technology or a new product or service that somehow the, the laws of, of economics and human behavior are different. Um, they, they haven't changed yet. Um, so, you know, every time there's a bubble that bursts, uh, there's an overcorrection. And we are seeing people taking money off the table. People are complaining that it's hard to raise money right now. And it is harder than it was uh, a year ago. Uh, because some people have overreacted and they will eventually come back. And and some people are still in the game, but they're using a, a renewed sense of caution. So, you know, if you are a startup and you are looking to raise money right now, you just need to be a realist, right? There's a new paradigm. Uh, it may change tomorrow or next week or next month, but right now it is what it is. So you work within that. Um, now, to some degree, in fact, there, there, I would argue that there is a little bit of a bubble that's already been created uh, with respect to AI startups. Um, if you say AI, again, very reminiscent of the dot coms, um, you know, I'm selling shoelaces. So what? Oh, I'm shoelaces.com. Oh, okay, you're you're a dot com. You're 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 hot. Uh, how much money do you want? Right. That's didn't quite work that way, but but that was somewhat of the sentiment. So now it's the same story, shoelaces.ai. Oh, your your shoelaces have AI built in? I'm not sure what they would do, maybe make you a better jogger or something, but um, I, I'm not going to invest in that, so please don't ask. But, um, you know, uh, th there there is a little bit of a bubble starting, um, but um, people are still doing their due diligence. Um, so, you know, trotting out another old saying, honesty is the best policy. And, and when I was thinking about that, I said, you know, that's interesting that they phrase it that way. Um, they don't, I mean, of course, you know, your mom, your dad, your, you know, your religion or what have you will tell you that honesty is a good thing. It's a moral thing. But if you think about that saying, it says honesty is the best policy. Um, so, that's kind of interesting. So, you know, I'll, I'll editorialize a, a little bit uh, to say uh, I have seen that in my life that honesty is the best policy in every relationship, not just business, because my wife remembers everything for the last 22 years. Um, and fortunately, uh, I made a decision a long time ago that, I, you know, not even a white lie. And and it's really fortunate because if we talk about a party from 20 years ago, I don't even remember going to the party. Um, so if I had fibbed about, you know, something that I had done um, and she would say, no, no, uh, I, you know, that's not true. That's not what you said or did or, or what have you. Then, you know, what is my word worth, right? If if it's a, it doesn't matter. You You created that question in the mind of the person or entity that you're entering into a relationship with. If I can't trust you about your revenues or about the customer or about having a, con oh yeah, I have a contract. Well, do you have a con? Well, he, you know, he said he was gonna sign. Okay, well then you don't have it. So if you're exaggerating, even again, unintentionally because you're trying to put on, then 
what is the investor going to think about when you make other statements? Um, so, you know, your your credibility can be damaged, you know, forever. And you know, to Rob's point, if you're if it's something material and you have misrepresented or lied, uh, they can ask for their money back. They can get, look for damages. And if it's intentionally, again, FTX, Theranos, whatever, we've all seen the consequences. Um, so, so what does this have to do with AI? Um, so, what do, do does anybody here think that the angels, VCs, uh, investors? They they haven't heard of Chat GPT. They they don't know. They're not looking to use these same tools. So if if you don't think that they're going to take your entire data room, uh, I'm going to assume people are you know somewhat familiar. If you're looking at at you know raising money, that you have to put all kinds of documents out there uh, for people to examine, and and you know those are documents that are you know kept. And, you know there's a history there, and you know the AI. Um, can go through every single word in your or, or number in your documents and look for inconsistencies, mistakes, uh, what have you. Uh, in, in fact, while I was preparing this presentation, uh, it, it gave me an idea. Um, and so I'll toss this out to, to Bix. We can talk about this later. Maybe you'll help me build this. Uh, I think we, we could have a great business, uh, an, an AI tool that would take all the information in your data room and then ideally you could plug in anything you know about the people that you're talking to angels vcs whatever and and the tool would examine what you've given and or what you're going to deliver uh, and look for mistakes inconsistencies so you can correct them and also to say well based on the uh, investment history of this other party and even you know maybe if you feed in their social media or whatever um you know based on what i know about the people that you're looking to invest instead of making your deck blue you should make it red uh in, instead of saying that you're going to you know make a billion dollars maybe you should just you know be more reasonable and so on so i think there's a there's a great opportunity here for the startups and, you know, because the investors, everybody is going to be using AI to analyze information better to make the best deal that you can. So um, until, you know, Bix builds this amazing service and, and, and I help to commercialize it, you're going to need to do your own approximation. Um, so use the tools. Uh, do you have decks, projections, other documents uh, that you're looking to present? Use it to run them through um, and, and look for mistakes, inconsistencies. Um, you know, uh, if you know, if you can um, tell it, you know, what questions would you ask based on this information as an investor? What questions would you ask? Um, you know, run your uh, everything you know about your competition through, say, so, you know, analyze the pros and cons of the competition, because again, the people that are looking to invest are going to be looking at who you compete with, and you know how how they compare. Um, um, you know, every financial model I've ever seen has dozens, probably hundreds of assumptions. Um, so say, you know, what what questions would you ask uh, based on, on on this model, right? And then you can be prepared for it. Uh, you know, why do you project that your revenues are going to go up 10x in year three? Uh, you know, you better be prepared for that question because it's coming. Um, so, you know, all these principles are are, are not new. They're from, I've seen them in previous you know due diligence, but now it's on steroids because they have all these tools that can be used. Um, so, you know, if if the investor doesn't come back with a whole bunch of objections, I, I would say you should take that as a sign that they're, they're one of two things. Uh, and if an investor isn't asking you a lot of hard questions, they're probably not interested. They're just yesing you to death. 
because uh, they don't want to argue. They don't want to be, you know, the, the messenger that gets shot for telling you that your business isn't going to work because if it does, then they look stupid or they don't get a chance to come in your next round. So if they're not giving you objections, it's because they're not looking to invest. The other possibility is that the investor is grandma. And um, while you're, you know, sitting at the table and you're asking her for money, she's going to give it to you anyway. She doesn't even know what an app is and why you want to build one, but you know, she loves you. So she's going to give you the money, whatever you're doing with it. Um, so, you know, if you're talking to serious investors, they are looking for every flaw before they write that check. Um, they're not being mean. Many of them are mean, but you know, that doesn't imply that this, these questions are, of any kind of malice. They're doing their job and you be ready for it. And when you answer them properly, then it won't be the first or the second or the fifth or the 10th. This is hard. But if you learn from this and you work at it, you will be able to hopefully raise money uh, because you will have used all the tools at your disposal, including AI, to, to be properly prepared. Uh, and, and just in closing, please, do, do everybody a favor, do not take grandma's money for your startup unless she's got a million dollars and you know that the few bucks that you're taking, if you lose them, she won't even care or notice. Um, otherwise, leave, leave her pension alone. In that, I'll, I'll, I'll pass, the, pass the baton. Poor grandma. Um, so again i was i was taking notes uh throughout your 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 talk your speech um <laughs> I, I really like the grandma example um so a lot of startups they they say like you know what i don't want investors because i don't want them to get in my way you know of making my business grow when you know investors they you know in, investors aren't tough business stuff economy stuff if someone is investing in you especially when you know they're not your grandma when someone is investing in you they really want your company to grow they're not just doing yeah because my, my grandson and you know it's my christmas gift you know they really want your company to grow and i feel that reflecting about ai it's really important of course we always we always have this risk of you know is are we you know are we following the same problem you know are, are we repeating our mistake you know when the dot-com bubble are we putting ai on everything and maybe there are things that we don't want ai attached to it or you know uh I, I, using another example um i guess like 10 or 15 years ago everything had bluetooth and we don't want bluetooth on everything we don't need it but everything had bluetooth um but ai is an amazing tool so uh once you you know, attached to your idea or you develop, you really need to answer, is it being helpful? Uh, is it making my my product, my idea, my project better? Or am I just, you know, pleasing someone? Because then we might create a bad quality product. And then that that's really dangerous, you know, for your uh, for a career because maybe there's competition has a good quality, quality product. And then that's the reason why you won't be able to <clears throat> make your startup grow. Um, so uh you know just so we can move along um i feel like we you know that that was a great um uh, i really am bubbling with this this idea um and you know don's ideas you know they they can make us reconsider how we evaluate startups in, in their own path to success and the rapidly increase of ai opens up many opportunities in lots of segments you know when i say that we really need to focus how you can use ai to your solutions not that you shouldn't you know the the very next uh tech revolution that the whole world will experience and it's already experienced in some level is based on ai as the previous one was based on data and before computing now we're talking about AI, and we can expect great advances in education health and overall increase in efficiency across all industries um, maybe even create new products new economy you know but along with these new opportunities there are new risks of course and to discuss these risks from a practical perspective we have invited an expert from Bix, Elio Pereira our head of international business development Elio it's always uh the, the greatest of pleasures to talk to you um but talking about 
all we've been discussing on AI projects. How can we mitigate risks in an AI project? Hi everyone. Well, this 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 is a this is a good question. This is a good question. Uh, and then uh, taking into consideration the uh, perspectives from Rob and Don, uh, I want to address some points here, thinking that there is uh, an investor that may be considering your company, uh, and how would would they how from a technical point of view, could you protect yourself and protect your customers and protect your future uh, using some uh, guidelines? So one thing that I would say that would be perhaps the most important one is the model selection. Which model am I going to use to implement my AI project or system or product? Am I going to use a proprietary? solution am i going to use an open source solution we have many uh open source solutions uh being uh developed and there are general there are general uh, solutions there are uh, specialized ones uh is the model that you're going to use pre-trained or are you going to train your model from scratch if your model is pre-trained then it comes already with data and then like robert said is this data proprietary is one so is are some pixels within an image from a copyrighted image for example so this is a this is a tough question uh, and a choice and then you know we're always talking about data ai need feeds on data so you need to take really good care about your data governance, how you collect it, how you clean it, who is going to have access to it. If I am using confidential information, how do I protect it? And then and um, these, these are, are questions that you must consider always. Another really important point is how you're going to train your model. Now, we are... Nowadays, when we talk about AI, we're most mostly interested in generative AI. But there are other types of applications that have been uh, with us for decades, right? Uh, and they all need some sort of training, on some sort of machine learning training that you input the data, uh, and then you uh, tag the data, you make annotations, and the model will learn and uh, be able to answer questions. But then uh, how are you going to deal with the uh, famous hallucinations? <laughs> That's a risk. That's a big, a big risk. Uh, you can do that by designing your training loop by putting a human in that training loop to annotate the hallucinations and then feed that feedback back into the model so it learns when it ha hallucinates. Uh, there are some, uh, you know, we, we work with uh, many different clients and different with the different needs. I'm just going to share a couple of them with you. One is the client saying, I want um, a chat GPT for my internal data. I And I want to, um, I don't want it to take into consideration any other data. So there are now ways where you can uh, feed your own data and the answers will be limited. The answer the chat bot will give you will be limited to that domain. So many uh, there are many ap applications going on uh, in ERP systems, in accounting systems, that they will input only your client, your uh, company data. Uh, and this uh, is being used uh, a lot. Another interesting point is that we are working with a startup that it's going to serve an, a manufacturing segment, a pretty considerable one. But and the startup really understands the business side, but not a lot the technical side. So the vast majority of their clients want the data to be in-house 
they want to do on-premise computing and now they're making this uh they are you know weighing the benefits because we know that it takes a lot of compute a lot of energy a lot of storage for you to train your model uh, if you want to use it for a more general purpose but if you want to use within a client's uh, own data um, that compute that the, the cost of that compute is going is going down is becoming more and more viable for you to have on-premise uh, download a model to your own servers on-premise and do your applications so this is some points i wanted to share about some of the risks involved on the technical side back to you luis yeah i was just uh, i was thinking about what you said Elio, about all these these applications and th there's this whole um sure now then the whole subject of ai is you know being way more discussed due to generative ai but there are several other applications and generative AI itself can be used a lot of things and it's really and, and, and you talk for what like five minutes if, if we gave you you know more time you'd be giving us way more examples <clears throat> so I guess that like for the last 30 years you know actually 30 years ago 40 years ago we would be facing a problem a problem of not having technology you know, but now we have the technology. Now maybe our limit is, you know, the very own human imagination. Um, uh, Luis, if, if I may add something, we, we have had the technology for a long time. What is new is the compute power, memory, uh, availability, and the ability to process that at lightning speed, you know? Yeah. This, you know, this uh, the event of having server farms mm -hmm. with hundreds of thousands of servers connected by fiber optics and high speed broadband. Now, that has made the technology viable. Yeah, uh, that's that's uh, we, we uh, the, the last right of revolution we had, which is was based on computing, it increased so much that now we're able to process all this data and due to the use of data, we can actually use AI because it's actually based on data. So yeah, I totally agree. Like it, it's the best moment in history for us to to actually, uh, you know, maybe our limit now is again, uh, imagination, you know, how we can use it because not only the power, but we have people, we are living in, in a world where we can access very talented people. Um, that's great. So uh, we are getting to to the end of our uh, scheduled hour, but yesterday we received a very interesting question, and I, I want to to ask that for you know uh, Don, Robert, and Elio. Um, but I would also please please um, ask you to maybe you know summarize the answer in a couple of minutes. But you know from each one's perspectives, um, will legislation ever catch up with tech? More specifically. How will we ensure ethical transparency? If there isn't a universal standard to operate AI, won't we be all over the place? Won't it be all over the place? If a set of data I use is inevitably biased, that system I just cheated will continue to perpetuate bias. Where's the checks and balances? So to summarize this, 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 uh, a lot of questions that we received, I feel like um again the question is really based on F ethics you know and and maybe biases you know how will this reflect what will happen considering these two perspectives you know laws and and you know legislation with bias what how can we prevent the AI from being biased and how will this affect uh, the very work that startups have regarding AI. I feel like we can follow the order. Maybe if Robert be, uh, begins answering, then Don, then Elio, can we do that? Sure, Luis. Um, well, we don't have to look very far into the past to see that um, uh, this question of bias, the misuse of data, the uh, the lack of, of, of ethics, 
on the part of even big players is endemic to the um, the internet uh, playing field. I mean, I'm thinking here of Facebook, uh, right? Um, uh, along comes this enormous potential for um, in-depth, individualized feedback on what it is I'm sending and receiving to a server. Uh, and not, not long after that, um, a good deal of manipulation. Um, the, I, I don't know whether, whether you were party to this, but uh, just recently the, the class action lawsuit uh, related to uh, Facebook's use of uh, uh, Cambridge, uh, who was it Cambridge? Uh, Cambridge Analytica? Cambridge Analytica's data. There was a class action lawsuit. And um, if you wanted to get on board about two weeks ago, you had to sign up to become part of that recovery. But they finally admitted, um, or at least settled, um, that, yeah, this was an abuse because we're reaching in to the end user's psyche based on, by, based on psychometric data. We're reaching in to manipulate these people on purpose. So it's, it's part of the DNA, I would submit, of, of the big internet players today to, to run this as far as they possibly can. And absent some kind of legislation on AI, uh, that's what's going to happen here. Now, uh, I know that there have been hearings, uh, countless Senate hearings. Uh, there was a big high profile event with um, uh, the CEO of OpenAI, uh, the CEOs of Google, uh, and all the other big players in Washington, DC for um, to address this. And I, I know in the case of uh, OpenAI CEO that, that uh, he openly advocates government regulation. So maybe government regulation is, is coming. And so then the issue here will be not what, not what do the, um, not uh, how, do we, how do we deal with those who play by the rules or who are subject to the laws, then the question becomes, well, what about those who aren't subject to the laws? Um, you know, I, I think that the question of bias in data sets is only the tip of the iceberg here, really. And, and the bias in the data set might go to important questions like who does and who doesn't get credit, right? Uh, financial credit uh, based on a biased data set, who does and doesn't get consideration for attendance at university. Um, those, those are harms here, but but I think down the road the the consider the potential harms go way way beyond bias and data sets, and they have to do with um, uh, something I mentioned o earlier: this ability to query and inspect the 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 chain of logic or the set of data that the AI used in coming to whatever answer it provided or in coming to whatever um, uh, function it called. So, you know, imagine not long from now, the use of AI to become my personal financial investor. And so we have an AI, whether it's offered by Schwab or, or offered independently, and it's interacting with Schwab to be, to, um, to uh, make decisions on my behalf concerning uh, the optimization of my portfolio. Well, when that one goes wrong, how are we able to say that that um, it made bad decisions? Um, we may not be even able to inspect how those decisions were made, um, you know, how they came to it. So I, I'm not sure. This is such a huge topic. I'm not sure how we even begin to wrestle it down or to begin to grapple with it. And, except by on a case-by-case -case basis. And unfortunately, it's always the case that the law comes after the fact. It comes after the harm. Um, you know, there will be, there will develop this, this body of common law in response to specific cases. And then when, there are, when there's a collection of sufficient harms, then the legislators will address it. But by then, the universe will have moved on. All of this worked well in a time pre-industrial times when the rate of change was so slow that the law could more or less uh, maintain pace 
with change. I don't know how the law is going to maintain pace with the change here that's that's going on now because everything's changing on a weekly basis as we move forward here, if not faster. Who knows what's going on today while we've been talking? That's Don, can you can you tell us a little bit more about you know from your perspective of due diligence uh, and how maybe you can prevent this bias from happening? That's a tough one. Um, so, I mean, I can certainly speculate and funny while Rob, while you were talking, I was thinking the same thing about, you know, how, how law is, you know, by its very nature reactive, right? Uh, I just, just watching, uh, you know, a, a, a you know, documentary or whatever, a, a thing on, on Bezos. And it's funny because, you know, as they were talking about Bezos and starting Amazon and so on, that um, it reminded me I'd forgotten that, what made the difference really uh, it was so close of whether e-commerce would ever really emerge and what made the difference in the early days because you know you it was the experience on dial-up was was not great and and you had to pay for shipping there was no prime was decades away and so it was the sales tax if i bought from amazon and i was in a high tax state especially and they shipped since they didn't have a presence you didn't pay sales tax and that five, six, seven, eight percent. Hey, if I'm saving, you know, that percentage that pays for my shipping. So sure, why not? I'll buy it on Amazon. Of course, you know, the irony is, you know, a few decades later after Bezos benefited from the fact that the law had not caught up with internet shopping and, and you know, that he then, once he was the 800 pound gorilla in the space wanted to close the door on the small merchants and so they wouldn't have that advantage and again jumped on board with the legislation that um has more or less eliminated tax-free shopping on, on, on the internet so um the you know local merchants legitimately argued that they were being harmed why do you have to pay sales tax when you you know, buy the book in my little bookstore, right? Outside from Barnes and Noble, right? But the little bookstore had to charge tax and Amazon didn't. So were they being harmed? Yeah. Um, have we benefited by the fact that, you know, e-commerce was allowed to propagate and, you know, it has, you know, fueled all this stuff? Yeah. So uh, really hard to say. We, you know, you know, the funny thing is that I suspect AI is probably right now being used or will be used to change that model. It's probably crunching right now, looking for ways to proactively create legislation that when we have people on the moon, uh, we're going to have to update our laws because gravity is different. So we should, the Congress will start passing laws probably tomorrow or next week relating to low gravity environments based on the fact that some legislative aid put it through chat GPT and said, there's a big hole in our legislation. Elio, what do you think? You know, I am, uh, I agree with you guys. I I'm really am uh, hopeful that self-regulation will play a big part of this thing. You know, the invisible hand of the market and the competition and consumer uh, advocates, etc., cetera, will, will enforce some uh, uh, compliance to uh, ethical rules and, and honest honest rules. But uh, many years ago, over 20 years ago, in the uh, IT area, we had uh, a saying that, you know, about artificial intelligence saying that, listen, whatever you do, don't teach it, don't teach it about human psychology, nor teach it to code software. And look what we have done with the, uh, uh, social networks that the models understand uh, how to get our attention, how to divide us, how to unite us, and now it can code as well. So you know the level of autonomy of these models, it's sometimes scary, and I'm not sure how leg legislation can you know keep up. It's going to be changes much faster and unpredictable. So we are in a in a in a new world, and I hope uh, we all come out well and alive. 
it's not just about you know uh, i feel like yes we'll come out you know well on the live and maybe like better than we are today you know it's, it's building a better world and technology historically is always a bit scary but it's also um it's what is making us as a world you know we are going further due to technology and also uh th there's something that robert and don uh, both said which you know they use the that idea of the le legislators and uh robert used the, the example of cambridge analytica uh, i feel like there's a, that that uh brilliant moment you know <laughs> awfully brilliant moment which mark zuckerberg is answering questions from uh from congress people and uh he's answering the most basic questions maybe i've ever heard about technology and about social media um, one of the reasons why that happened is because, you know, talking about GDPR and all these laws related to, to, to data, they, they really, you know, happen after this event. So this moment we had today, you know, the, this past hour, which is ending of talking to each other about AI in this, um, and, and the legal issues and the impact in our world, it's really important for us to actually take the, the upper hand, you know, taking the first step regarding building not only new technologies, but this new society. So uh, it's been to me uh, a great honor and also an incredible journey of knowledge and insights. I'd like to extend a huge thank to, thank to Robert, Don, Elio for engaging and, and all the information you guys brought us. Um, of course, our hour has already ended. So if you that has been with us for the last hour, you know, you had any questions or just want to talk about something, I feel like you can reach to all our speakers, to Robert, to Don and Elio on LinkedIn. Um, I know you guys already sent before your LinkedIn here in our chat, but maybe you can send again. Maybe someone arrived a little bit uh, later. And of course, if you have any challenges and want to talk to Big Stack, you know, maybe about uh, a bigger uh, uh, question or a more general question regarding AI, of course, it would be an honor to us. And all this conversation, these contribu contributions have enriched our perspectives on innovations, risks, business preparations, and security. Um, and that's it, guys. Thank you so much uh, for, you know, uh, being here in this Innovation and Technology Business Gathering. Uh, remember, of course, as I said, that the conversations, they do not end here. So please keep exploring, learning, and applying these ideas in your own contexts. And of course, if you know uh, you do it, please reach out to me and to everyone here at Bix. We would love to, to hear how our conversation has helped you. And innovation never stops. And I hope this event has inspired all of you to embrace change with confidence and determination. Thank you all for being here and until the next gathering. Thank you, Luis. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, all. Bye-bye.